Good morning, brothers and sisters. One of the struggles we can have in our spiritual life and our relationship with Christ is honesty in prayer. This might not sound that significant, but it's very, very important. It's, it's easy for us not necessarily to lie to the Lord. We know that's always a bad idea, but just not to be honest about what's in our mind and in our heart with the Lord. Like we do with people we want to impress, we try to put our best foot forward. We try to let them see the best version of ourselves. The problem is Jesus sees your heart, so it doesn't do any good. He'd rather you be honest with him, even if that honesty is not always pretty or good looking. We're afraid to do this at times because we think in a worldly manner. We think that Jesus acts like earthly rulers who we need to appease, who we need to impress. And Jesus is teaching us in the gospel today that's not the kind of Lord that he is. That's not the ruler that he will be for us. And that's not how he wants us to act as rulers ourselves. He points out, I come among you not to be served by you, but to serve you. Jesus comes so humbly and so gently. He's so compassionate. And we often forget this in our spiritual lives and in our prayer life. On some level, we have to be impressed with James and John in the gospel today. They're quite brave. They approach Jesus and they have a request for him. Jesus, who already sees their heart, he knows what's going on better than they do, invites them to ask their question. What what do you ask of me, the Lord says. They're not going to trick him. He knows what they're saying. And they ask, when you come into your glory, we want to sit on your right and on your left. Now, what James and John are talking about is they think that Jesus' kingdom is going to be an earthly kingdom that he's going to have earthly power, earthly glory, and they want to share in that earthly power and glory. They want to be above everyone else except for Jesus. They want all of the other apostles to be on lower thrones than them. This is quite a statement. It's not surprising that the other apostles get a little jealous, probably because they thought, why didn't we think to ask him first? Now, this is not a holy request. There's nothing particularly virtuous about this, but it's very honest. It's very honest. They're not hiding their ambition from the Lord. Of course, they don't know why Jesus has come. They don't yet understand his real mission and his great humility. But Jesus doesn't dismiss them, does he? They ask their question. He doesn't say, how dare you ask for earthly glory when I have come only for heavenly glory? No, There's no criticism or condemnation. In fact, Jesus kind of tricks them. He invites them to a deeper understanding, and he does it in such a way that they don't really know what he's talking about. What does he say to them? Oh, oh, you you want to share in my glory? Can you drink from the chalice that I will drink? Can be baptized with my baptism? Honestly, can any of you figure out what he is meaning by this? Can you think that the apostles are like, understanding the Lord. Do you know what they thought? You see, at this time in history, whenever a king wanted to show honor to one of his servants, he would let them drink from his cup. I mean, there was no greater honor drinking from the cup of the king. This is what the apostles are thinking. And of course, James and John, yes, Lord, you know, we will definitely drink from your cup, still thinking in an earthly manner, in earthly glory and authority. They're thinking that, yes, the other apostles will have to respect us if we drink from your cup. This is not what Jesus is talking about. The prophecies in the Old Testament are quite clear that the Messiah who is to come would have to suffer and die. And the imagery that's used in these prophecies is that he would have to drink the cup of suffering to its dregs, meaning to the end. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's actually saying, oh, you want to share in my glory? Then you're going to have to suffer like me. Though the apostles don't realize this. And so, of course, James and John are like, yes, Lord, we will drink from that cup, having no idea what they are promising. Absolutely no idea. But the Lord knows. The Lord knows. He knows the secrets, the mysteries that are hidden from them. He sees that at this point in their lives, these are just kind of worldly men who have worldly ambitions, but he has called them to something greater, something higher, to serve his glory and his kingdom in a humble, in a gentle, 
in a merciful way, modeling his own love for humanity. And we know the rest of the story. We know that James and John, as well as the other apostles, except, of course, for Judas, eventually do come to share in Christ's suffering. They each become martyrs in their own way for the gospel. At this time in their life, they're, they're not even close. But you have to admire their honesty in prayer. These are not timid men. They are willing to approach the Lord. And notice how gentle Jesus is with them, even with their worldly requests. Now, he doesn't give them what they want. He doesn't give them earthly glory. He doesn't give them earthly thrones, at least not in the sense that they think. So technically, the answer they got was no. But that didn't stop Jesus from calling them on to greater things. He didn't dismiss them or turn them away. We have to remember this in our own spiritual lives. We have to be just as honest with Jesus, even sometimes when our requests are worldly or at least self-centered. Jesus already knows your heart. It's not like you're going to tell him something new in prayer. Oh, I didn't realize you were going to ask for that, the Lord says. Honesty in prayer doesn't help the Lord. It actually helps us. And why is it so important? Jesus will speak the truth to you if you're praying to him. He will. I promise you. He promises you. But the only way you can properly understand his words is if you have first been honest to him with yours. This is one of the reasons we don't understand what Jesus is doing in our lives, because we're not being honest with him. We're not speaking to him. Sometimes in prayer, of course, the answer is no. Sometimes it's later. Sometimes it's yes. But if you ask the Lord for something, it could be even something earthly, like a raise. Lord, I really need a raise for my job. And you don't get it. You're like, Lord, why didn't you answer my prayer? He's like, I did. I didn't give you the raise. (laughs) You asked. I didn't give it to you. Now you need to figure out why I didn't give it to you. You want to grow in holiness? You want to understand me, says the Lord. You have to understand why I do and don't do certain things. Why I respond to you in certain ways. Sometimes he'll say yes, sometimes he'll say no. But in each interaction and exchange through your own reflection upon what Jesus does in your life, you can grow and learn and ultimately become that person to which the Lord is calling you. So I want to share with you a small example from my own life when I was in undergraduate studies in college. I went to a talk by a visiting speaker and he was just giving a talk to young men. There were about 200 men, young men, college age men, crammed in an auditorium about this size, about the size of St. Dorothy's. We were packed pretty tight in there. And he was giving a talk about chastity and virtue as men. It was a really phenomenal talk, just absolutely amazing. And at the end of the talk, he led us all in a prayer, just asking God's grace and blessing to help us become better men and, and holier men. And we all had our heads bowed. And at the end of the prayer, I will never forget these words because of what happened after. He ended his prayer very appropriately this way. He said, we ask all of this through the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Mother of God. And right as the last syllable of the last word exited his mouth, this demonic scream began to emanate throughout the room. Now, I was standing in the far back corner, left-hand side of this room, against the wall. Immediately, every man lifts up their heads and tries to look around and see where is this sound coming from. And I tell you from my own experience, I could hear it in front of me and above me and below me, to my right and to my left. I could even hear the sound emanating from the walls behind me. It was impossible to tell where this demonic scream was coming from. It was absolutely terrifying. But within a few seconds, a young man in the front row begins throwing chairs across the room, screaming demonically. Now, I don't watch scary movies. I don't recommend anyone do that. I don't think it's good for your soul. But in the few snippets of movies that I've seen over the years, I've never heard anything this terrifying. This was a true demonic voice. The young man was possessed, 
And at the end of that prayer, the demon manifested, took control of him, and began thrashing. Now immediately, the ten priests who were in the room dive-bombed this guy, tackled him to the ground, and began praying over him. I'd say about half the men in the room ran screaming, terrified, from the room, you can imagine. I have to admit, for me, one of the most pleasant moments was seeing a lot of the big football players run out screaming. After being a little guy, I was kind of enjoyed that, just slightly. The rest of us stayed out of curiosity to some extent, and I pulled out my rosary and started praying. But after a few minutes, I believe it was my guardian angel, said very clearly to my heart, you need to leave, you're helping the demon. And I, I didn't understand, he said, it's your curiosity. It's feeding the demon. Get as many men as you can and leave. So I stood up and I started telling the guys, we need to leave, we can't stay for this. You know, I wanted to watch the exorcism. So most of the guys followed me out, and we went just a short distance to what was a perpetual adoration chapel. And it was a very small chapel. It could only fit maybe 25 people comfortably. So maybe 75 guys cram into this chapel, probably scaring the few adorers who were supposed to be there. And we're literally like sardines packed in this chapel. And I was very close in the front up to the altar, crammed between the wall and this one guy on my left. And within a few minutes of being there, I'm just praying some decades of the rosary, I hear the Lord say to me, as clear as day, David, lead them in the Divine Mercy Chapel. I heard the Lord speak those words to me. It wasn't just in my heart. I actually heard them. I knew Jesus wanted me to lead them, to pray for this exorcism in this young man. Now, at that point in my life, I was fairly shy and, and timid. I was not a public speaker. I had no gumption or desire to do that. And so my first thought after hearing the Lord speak to me was, please, not me. <laughs> no. And I was so afraid. I was getting nervous. And I said, Jesus, please don't make me do this. <laughs> Find somebody else. Right after I said that prayer, the guy who was immediately to my left stood up and said, I think the Lord wants us to pray a divine mercy chaplet. And then he led us in the chaplet. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to get up in front of people. I was just too timid. I was too afraid to do it. I was very grateful to God for finding somebody else to take my place. Well, the next day in my prayer, it occurred to me that maybe the Lord was disappointed in me. I mean, think about it. The Lord had spoken to me so clearly, asking me to do something for him and for this poor young man who had been possessed. And I said no to the Lord. I said, Lord, find somebody else. I mean, it wasn't that I didn't want to do it. I was just too afraid, too timid. And I thought, maybe the Lord's upset with me. Maybe he's unhappy. But if you were listening to our second reading today, from the letter to the Hebrews, you remember this, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. I realized that Jesus wasn't upset with me for denying his request and asking him to find somebody else. That the Lord, who knows everything, knew I was going to do that. He knew when he asked me, I would say no. He knew I wasn't courageous enough or brave enough to do it. But he asked me nonetheless, and he respected my request to find someone else. And this encounter with the Lord taught me something very powerful about prayer. That the Lord will never force you to do anything you do not want to do. That the Lord merely asks but he always respects your will. And with that gentleness and compassion I felt from him, it spurred me on to want to do more for him, to want to grow, to want maybe one day to be a decent public speaker, to not be as timid afraid about being up in front of people. And look what the Lord can do in us. Look how he can change our hearts and help us to grow. As he did with the apostles, as he's done with me, he can do with each one of us, 
but it's essential in our prayer life to be honest with him. Not to give the Lord what you think he wants, but to be honest from your heart with him. Not only in your answers or responses or requests to the Lord, but also in the desires of your heart. So when the Lord does ask something of you, and you're not inclined at that time for whatever reason to say yes, tell him. But at the same time, ask him for the grace to grow. Maybe one day, Lord, I can be strong enough to serve you in that way. The Lord will not dismiss you. He doesn't turn his back on you. He's so gentle and compassionate. He's come to serve you and to help you grow in holiness. But you must be honest with him in your prayer and not be afraid. Never forget how much he has already done for you. Don't think he would ever refuse to do more. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.